My own past is very much influenced by having been a part of the church in the fact that I was six or seven years an RSCM chorister and sang and travelled to various wonderful places such as King's College, Wells Cathedral, Royal Albert Hall and many other beautiful churches. My own tastes in music are very broad and eclectic but I have a great fondness for church music. For seven years I used to teach near to Beverly at Hornsey then I moved down south. So with this past and information in mind, it's always a wonderful pleasure to get an invitation from my friend Liz to go and stay and then go into Evensong with her. Let this film and painting be dedicated to those wonderful memories and choir and beautiful minster. traditional watercolour using washes and glazes and gradually building up but I hope to leave a slight vignette around the outside to make it slightly looser there. It's going to be a very complicated one, the drawing has to be pretty good to start with. Um, it's a subject that I did some years ago now, Ooh, it must be nearly 15-20 years ago, of Beverly Minster. So I'm using some old film to show you the previous picture and how I designed and built it up in oils and then I'm going to do this one as I say in watercolour on a a rough paper, but it's, it's just off rough. It's, it's sort of in between um, not and rough. I'm going to do a large scale painting this time, as I say, for fun. For security reasons, I shan't be showing much detail on the faces and so on. When I paint, I paint fairly impressionistically anyway, so I shan't be painting any child's portraits or anything else of the choristers. We have to be very careful about that these days. And the little bit of film that I do show of the actual minster uh, will not enable you to see those faces for those reasons. They'll be kept blurred and out of focus. So, let's go ahead and have some fun doing this picture, which I hope to make into some Christmas cards later, because it's a very good subject for that, and show you a way of working in between the very tight figurative out towards a slightly looser work at the edges in this beautiful medium. And as a tradition between Liz and I, after the even song at the Minster, Liz and I always like a good pint of bitter afterwards. <laughs> And now to explain the previous painting that I did in oils of the Minster the interior. It's quite a complicated drawing and requires some juggling with perspective. As you know, things that go away from us, to make them appear to do so, means that we have to make the lines move together in single point perspective in this case. But it's not only the vanishing point going away, there's also the height of the building. So we have to give the illusion of the height by making the lines come together as they come towards the top as well. 
Then we have to consider the arches as they regress towards the back and also the tiling which is very very useful. If you look down on squares they look square but as they go away from you they'll become narrower and you have this perspective like railway lines or tram lines. The tiles in Beverly are not only not just squares but also geometric shapes which give an illusion of form turning the two-dimensional shapes into three-dimensional surfaces almost making the floor appear to come up into different blocks. Here is my basic structural design to give that feeling of space, height and depth before you see the final piece. Before we even start this watercolour, let me take you through uh, materials we're going to use and the processes. This is the paper now, it's been stretched overnight, it wants drying slightly more, I've used brown tape to do so. And now I'm going to show you a piece from my earlier foundation to watercolour films on how to stretch this paper. And then we'll run through the brushes and uh, other materials that we're going to need for producing this picture. Right, I mentioned there are three sorts of watercolour paper. The hot press, which is the smoothest, the knot, which we say is not either, neither rough nor smooth. And then the uh, rough, which is the roughest of all. This one's a knot, it's the one in between. And not only is there the different surfaces of the paper, there's the different weights, and the different weights are the different thicknesses. A hundred pound weight is adequate for nearly all work, but you can go to 200 or 300 pound, which is almost like card. Now, when you've got a thinner paper, like a hundred pound, you need to stretch it. You need to place it onto a board to support it and stretch the paper. It's adequate with a small sheet just to put ordinary masking tape around, but with a larger sheet, you'll want to stretch it. This means put water onto it, both sides, so that the paper expands, lay it on the board, and then put gum tape over. Now the trick to this is, if you have a whole reel of gum tape, you've only got to touch the edge of the reel with a wet finger, and the whole reel is ruined, because later it'll all stick together. So, with dry hands, cut the tape to the lengths you want for your paper, and then have them quite separate, and be prepared to put the paper under the water. There's nothing fancy to it, all we do is take our paper, run the tap, run the water over the paper both sides, as quick as that, no messing about, ever so easy to do, you can use a shower if you want, and that's it. Don't spend any more time on it. Now there is a right and a wrong side to the paper. If you have a whole sheet of watercolour paper and you hold it up, you'll see the mark. It might be Bockenford or Waterford. If you can read the mark the right way around, that is the right way up for the paper. It's a nice surface of the paper and you want to get the right side because the other side isn't quite as pleasant. You can usually recognise the surface with a little bit of experience. Place the paper down onto the board. It will start to cockle fairly quickly. Don't worry about that at all. That's what it's meant to do. Then run your paper under the tap, your, your gum tape under the tap, and slap it straight onto the board. Don't mess about. No, no, no need to, to do anything else but this. Just so simple. Straight, half and half, just over the edge of the paper. Smooth it down. There. So it really is quite a simple thing to do. Now you don't need to do this in most cases. Just ordinary masking tape on your paper will normally hold it down quite adequately and saves a lot of hassle later if it's a bit all over the place. But if you're using a larger sheet and you want a really smooth surface, then this is the thing to do. And why? Because when you paint onto watercolour paper, the amount of wetness will cockle up the watercolour paper. It will start to go all wavy and bubbly. And if you want to avoid that, then this is the way to do it. Because when this is dry, it'll be as tight as a drum. And um, when you paint onto it, even if it cockles slightly, it will then stretch out again afterwards. Don't make the mistake, as some amateurs do, of taping it, and when it's dry, cutting it off. It hasn't changed the paper, and it's still under cockle just the same. You have to leave it on the board when it's dry to paint on, and you only cut it off when you're finished completely, okay? One other thing is don't be tempted to dry it too quickly. Don't put it in front of a fan heater or a fire because it can dry so fast and so much that it will actually tear across the middle when it contracts. Just let it dry gently overnight or for a few hours and you'll soon be able to paint on it. Now there are two uh, ways to keep watercolours. One is in a pan set, in other words the same liquid paints as are in these tubes but already in little pans or in little boxes and squares and they're already dried out and just need a little bit of water. 
or the way that I use them is to buy the tubes and I think these larger tubes are far better um, because you get more value for money. In this case it's a Society of All Artists tube, reasonably priced paints, but what you will notice is on it it says artist watercolour and that is the most important thing, that we do not, in, in watercolour painting, we do not use cheaper paints, you have to use the artist quality, that's absolutely vital. Uh, with any other paint you might get away with it, with acrylics, with oils, but with watercolour it's vitally used only artist quality. Um, now, once they're squeezed onto a palette and dried out, they're the same as the ones in the pans. So all I have to do to get these working again is simply to put a little bit of water on to soften them, and I'm working away. Here I've got some uh, raw sienna, and I'm going to use mainly for this painting just four colours. And that's going to be the raw sienna, burnt sienna, uh, indigo and ultramarine. And I can use those as my base colours for almost the whole of this painting of Beverly Minster. Although I will be using a larger palette and I will be tinting in with other yellows and other warms and cools as well as I go along. But that's my main base palette. For most interiors of churches or so on, that would do me. It's a limited palette and we can get nearly all the colours we want out of that. But I will show you some other colours. So there's my base box of colours. I tend to buy the bigger tubes here. Uh, these are 40 millilitres because they go further and they're cheaper buying them that way. But it isn't cheap. But watercolour does last a long time, especially um, an artist watercolour, an artist quality watercolour. So let's take a look at the other colours I might use. Well, here's a full range of watercolour, showing almost every colour I might need, from bright crimson reds through to uh, cadmium oranges, roses, um, cobalt violets, the various greens and blues, everything there that I will want. But I'll go into those colours as we go along. In more depth, it's in my watercolour film, but in this one, we're not going to need all of these colours, just a few of them. I can keep all of my various colours in sequence, so if I want cooler yellows or warmer yellows, if I want cooler reds or warmer reds, if I want cooler blues or warmer blues, I've got them there together going around in a colour circle almost. To help you see these colours more clearly, and possibly buy them for yourself, here's a chart of the basic colours that I think are necessary. Of course there are far more than this, but if you have this amount, you'll find you can do almost anything. Remember, most of these colours are vital. Many colours cannot be mixed, such as the cobalt violet and so on, so you do need to have them ready-made in tubes. Now, what other materials am I going to need? Well, I will be using some drawing gum for this. This is a Fabio one, and it's a blue drawing gum. I prefer the blue drawing gum because I can see where it's gone on the white paper afterwards. This is called masking fluid, basically, and it's a rubber solution which we can place onto the areas of paper where we don't want the paint to go, and we can rub it off later and then repaint those or tint those in. It gives a nice sharp line and great for textures, and we're definitely going to be using it for the highlights in so much of this wooden carving in the uh, Beverly Minster scene. Now, there seems an awful lot of brushes here. You'll also notice sponges. These sea sponges are very good for doing textural work on leaves or beaches. I've got a little tube of white gouache for retouching white areas. If I do go over where I don't want to go and put a bit of white back in again, I could also use a bit of pastel for that. For my basic drawing, I have my pencil and rubbers. And you'll see a plethora of brushes here, ranging from toothbrushes here through to oval mops, to round brushes, to fans, to sword brushes, to hake brushes, to flats, and even ones with serrated edges there, look. Now, all of these brushes are for different purposes. And unlike oil painting, where I might only need five or six brushes, just so I use mainly filberts and rounds, and the same for acrylics, for watercolours with so many different effects and textures to get, I find that I need a series of brushes. It's not like a fisherman who has a hundred floats but only has two favourites. Um, although I might only use two brushes, I could get away with just the oval mop and a rigger, this long thin one here, which is to give a very thin line, used to be for painting rig rigging on sailing ships. Um, as Rod Ramson got away with a um, hake brush and a rigger as well. You can paint a painting with just limited amount of brushes. But it's nice to have all of the brushes there for those various effects if you need them, and for different styles of painting. But the one we're going to do, I'm going to mainly need my oval mop and a few small rounds. We won't need many brushes for this job. I may use a few flats for dry brush work in places as well, but not much. I also have my Profi pens here, the fine line pens for drawing with, of different sizes. And I have in here a piece of stick for using with Indian ink, sharpened at the end, which gives a very nice line as well. And of course I can use brush with Indian ink as well. I have my China graph pencils, very useful. You see they peel back here, you don't have to sharpen them in the field. 
and they give a waxy dark mark, great for doing snow scenes, dark areas, they will tint with watercolour and you can paint watercolour over them because they don't move, so a black a China Graph pencil, very useful. Here I have a clay shaper which is useful for putting the masking fluid on, I shall be using that because it rubs off very easily off the end. And the toothbrush which I mentioned earlier here is very good for splatter work, for flicking uh, watercolour onto a scene such as snow or so on. So there's my selection and why. Now that the paper's dried and stretched it's time to start the design and the drawings. So I've had these composite photographs I've put together and various uh, photographs I've taken within the Minster over the last few years and uh, I now need to put those together into one composition so I can just rest the drawing board on my lap and sit there and gradually work it out bit by bit. Here I'm going to show you how the drawing evolves. This is about two thirds of the way through now. Careful not to smudge it too much, uh, not to rub the paper surface too much either, otherwise it ruins it for watercolour. I'm using an ordinary uh, B pencil. You can see here I've started from the top centre and I'll work my way out, exploding outwards, into the right, round down to the floor, and then right out and down round to the left and up into the roof. I've gone quite dark in some places as I want that to actually add to the watercolour painting. Perspective is an invention and an illusion to give an illusion of distance, in this case one point perspective, but also I've changed the perspective, invented and reused it to give distance up into the ceiling and the vaults as well. The vital horizon or eye level is about the shoulder height of the choir master. From there everything either goes up or down and it gives the scale as well. Right, now we've got the drawing done, we want to get the masking fluid on. and. Uh, Leave that to dry, and once that's totally dry, then we can start the watercolour itself. Now, masking fluid um, is a liquid latex which you put on so that we can peel it off later, um, leaving white areas. It means we can do very fine, light, sharp areas, paint over it, and then remove the latex afterwards and tint those areas in. Make sure you do make sure the latex is totally dry, the masking liquid is totally dry, before you um, start putting watercolour on. Also, don't leave it in the sunlight uh, because it tends to melt into the paper and it's very difficult to get it off later. Don't have it on too long, in other words. Put it on and then, um, as soon as it's dry, or within that day, uh, preferably, start to work on the painting. Right, I'm using this um, clay shaper tool to put my masking fluid on. And it's just odd spots and dashes here and there that I'm going to need. So these lights, for instance, um, I want to put masking fluid where they are, just to start off. And you can see it's a slightly greyer, a bluer liquid than um, the paper. So I can see where it's gone afterwards. What we do is put all of that on to these little light areas that we want, just leaving little highlights and so on. Um, on places like these um, bits of wood carving, we want little highlights left there, sharply just catching the light all the way along, little dots and dashes, quite loosely in this case, because although I'm going to be painting quite tightly in some areas, I'm going to be quite loose on others. We get the highlights of light across the varnish on the woodwork, the polish in the past. Now I'm going to also use the pencil drawing as a part of the actual painting. Um, as you saw with this painting of Beverly Minster from the outside in springtime one year, um, I've let the pencil marks show through the watercolour, I've done them a little bit more heavily to make it almost a coloured drawing. And in this case I'm going to be doing a little bit of that as well, rather than have to paint all of my details in. There's quite a lot of this to do in this particular painting. I won't show you it all, I'll just do some of the basics just to show you how it can be done. Because we, don't, we can't uh, paint in white lines unless we use gouache. We have to leave this white paper showing later for these light areas to show because we're painting dark onto light, we're not painting light onto dark as we would with a, an opaque paint. Remember watercolour is translucent, transparent and we're working with this beautiful translucency as the main beauty of the 
Right, I'm hoping that should be enough. I've coated the uh, surplices and cassocks and so on, and all the little highlights on the varnish and so on here. And I'm hoping the rest I can do by just carefully manipulating the paint. And we're now prepared and ready. My studies are there, my brushes and all the tools I need. Two sets of paints are laid out, ready with water. And, of course, the painting itself is there, ready prepared on an easel. In this case, I'm going to work on a vertical. Uh, normally, for a landscape, I'd work on a flat, but demonstrating the vertical is more useful. And as I'm not doing a lot of wet into wet with this particular painting, then I think that this should be um, OK. OK, I'm going to start off this watercolour by doing the uh, organ area here, which I actually deliberately haven't put masking fluid onto, even though it's a very light area. Before I start painting, I need to soften my paints up. Now, I'm not going to be using the limited palette at this time, but I'm going to put water in my main palette all the way around the top of these paints, which have had a long time to dry out because the watercolours, quite handily, will go solid after a while, just like the, the uh, blocks in pan sets, and you'll be scrubbing at them if you don't put a bit of water on first just to soften them. Leave them about five or ten minutes and they'll be ready, and then all you have to do is tickle them with a brush to bring the paint off. And I'm going to want some of these lighter colours first of all, for some of the more detailed areas of the organ and so on, and then I'll be down to my limited palette later. Right, looking at my yellows here, I've got a cool yellow here, which is the lemon yellow, and next to it, which looks darker, but in fact it isn't, is the Oriolan yellow, which I prefer, which is a much lighter, more transparent yellow than the lemon. Then over here we've got raw sienna, we've got um, chrome, and we've got, or cadmium yellow would be equal to it, and we've got cadmium orange. I'm going to start off with the uh, Oriolan yellow, and then work into some of the chrome, and then work up to my warmer colours as I go on. We always start with our lightest colours first, and work through to our darkest. So. So that's the area I'm going to work on. Here are the photographs just to show you um, what it's like. And I've got my photographs next to me as well here to do this. The lighter areas here and slightly darker one there. So I'm going to start off with leaving some whites and using the paint very thinly just to glaze in a light creamy yellow at first down these pipes, leaving areas of white showing as a texture because we've got shiny light pipes down here. I haven't put masking fluid on, as I say, deliberately. I just want to uh, tint it, and I can paint quite easily down these lines. All the way down here, there's little bits of light as well, but we won't overdo that. Nice golden yellow. And we'll get darker colours into that in just a moment. And I've got masking fluid on the bottoms of the pipes here, where there's a little bit of white actually gleaming, so I want to go, obviously I need to go across those areas to make sure that that white shows out through the colour later. So down here, gradually building it up, so they stay actually fairly light. Just tickling that, just tickling that paint I'm on. Going now I'm going to go down to a yellow, slightly yellow, darker yellow, yellow, the chrome yellow. yellow. And you can see next to the lemon, the uh, Oriolan yellow, the more lemony yellow, how much richer that is. We just start to work some of this warmer yellow down here amongst these pipes. You see the difference straight away down the sides, much warmer down between those two pipes. Something quite carefully. Just tip the brush down there, make sure it's nice and tidy. A little bit down here. And up into the golden areas of this. Bits of paint amongst the lighter yellow down here as well. We're going to tickle in some darker lines later with a very fine brush just to get this feeling of these lovely golden pipes. Almost there now. Remember that we can lift out any time we want, so I can take a clean brush and with the same brush wash it off. But if I feel I've put a bit too much paint on, I can just use the wet brush to lift out, make it into a blade look, put it between my fingers, make it into a blade, and I can just lift out any little bits of yellow if I don't want them. Now, I'm going to go down one tone, going down now to my raw sienna, you can see how much warmer that is, it's a very golden brown. And again, we'll come back in with that, just dropping it in between the lines of the pipes. It's a bit warmer down here. Let's go down this end here. 
Details I can pick up later. I just want to get the ambience at the moment. Down here, bottom of the pipe. Well, even more orange, in fact, in a minute. Pipes there. Down that inside edge. Well, I've got that colour on my brush. At the same time, it's also down here. And then I want that to dry off a bit because I'm going to come back in with a very fine brush and start laying in some warmer colours. Take a little touch of burnt sienna now. Now burnt sienna is the same colour but with a little bit more... <laughs> it's the same thing basically but it's been burnt. So it makes it a bit more brown, a bit more ready. Just start dropping that in down here as well. There we go. So we'll let that dry off and then we're going to come in with a much finer brush and just tickle up some of the details in there. Right, next I want to work on these redder areas just around here, these decorations down the sides of the organ pipes. And then I'm going to put in some of the darker colours in between. So I'm going to use a finer brush and use a little bit of this cadmium red here. We've got some scarlet there for later. And we just want to carefully work down. down. These red areas just around here, yeah. and we've got some nice and decoration. This first work I'm doing obviously is very detailed, and uh, as I go on with the painting, in fact I shan't be working into more detail, I'll be working the other way around, I shall be gradually going looser with the painting. So put some decoration right down the eyes. Just, just indicating, indicating it, but we're going to be exact. But as when you're back from this, you can't see this detail. Now I want to come down to these dark areas between the pipes and in between on the woodwork. And I've got a choice. I can use either the uh, ultramarine and the burnt sienna, or I've got my indigo as well for very dark. At the moment I don't want to go too dark. I think I'll use my ultramarine. It's already been dampened, so it's fairly strong. and some of the burnt sienna and that will give me quite a nice dark, but a warm dark and I can go either way into that, it gives me, if you like, a grey it's a lovely colour for using greys, you can make for skies as well the, the warmer or the cooler grey by using more of the blue or more of the brown I want the paint fairly thick for this, not too thin because it's not a glaze I'm doing, it's actually dark areas so now we're going to start on some of these detailed areas Let's just see how dark it is. We'll put it down here at the bottom. There we go. And I can always come in darker later. I'll just gradually work this up. Now, working on the verticals, so I've got to be a bit careful that my trickles come. I'm using a slightly larger brush at the moment just to fill in these larger shadows. We'll just block these areas in straight. I'll gradually work this out. In a moment, I'll work down to my smaller brushes. You can see how the pencil marks are also aiding me here because they're helping to give me the darks as well where the paint shows transparently through. I should come a bit darker into that afterwards. Just build up these mid-tones first. Right, now I need to come down to a slightly smaller brush. Before I do that, I'm just going to take a little bit of pure ultramarine, just a little bit of thin ultramarine and these, some of these areas need to be a bit bluer up here. It's a blue tint that comes across quite a lot of this woodwork. You have to really look for these colours, remember, all the time. Painting, you've really got to make sure that you're not just plonking things on without looking and thinking. Now I'll add to the smaller brush. I'm going to make it a little bit darker now. I'm going to add a touch of the um, indigo to it. A touch of indigo in with the burnt sienna as well to go that bit darker. That will give us just that bit more depth into here. And we really start to look now at slightly finer details on this organ. In between here, between the triangles. filigree work that's all into here. I do want this sort of detail at the moment. So we're starting to get that shiny effect now of the gold paint and gold leafing 
on the organ pipes. And just back into there a touch with a little bit of the yellow from earlier. The top here with these golds. That's the organ pipes done for the moment. Now we'll work our way down to the filigree work around here. I'm going to work my way down here now and the first thing I want to do is to get the lightest undercoats in. There's this yellow shining through from the artificial light across the um, and through these bits of uh, wood carving and filigree here. Um, there's some lighter colours coming down here and then we're going to work up the warmer browns and then into the blues and then through to the darks again. So my necks are going to be a series of, of washes just laid one into another, wet next to wet, blending in through here, let those dry and then we'll work the details over the top. So starting with my number eight again, I'm going to come in with the yellow first of all. In this case I'm going to be using the, the chrome yellow quite thinly just to give a wash through here and right through all of that no worry I'm going to come up with the blue in a minute right through all of that no worry thin it down just a fraction and that comes right the way through there and across the top here we've got masking fluid across the top there to show the lights out as well the yellow is also going to come down inside here. And that's about where it does. The blue is coming across the rest and across here as well. And then I'm then back, going to, back my to my ultramarine, ultramarine again. Wash, wash all the way all across, across the rest, linking, linking it in, letting that one color kind of blend into another slightly, slightly hard at the edges there. there. So it's it's ultramarine, ultramarine, very thinly, very thinly as, a wash, as a wash, right through, through the whole of this, and right, down, right down, down through to the quiet wire here. here, letting it just softly blend in a bit, all the way down there. I'm not going to come across that bit because I've got masking to go there, there anyway. Leave a little bit of space in here and there. Let's through. We've got the across some of the yellow now here. Right through. through. Just, just, just. Through there. Little bits of light just showing through. So actually, things are coming together fairly rapidly even now. Now, now while it's still wet, wet I want to drop in the okay. colour there, so I'm going to mix my ultramarine and sienna again. And just start to warm things up a bit here now. I'm going to drop into there, into those areas, these darks, just let them spread out a bit. Let the wet into wet do the work. Now when we paint wet onto dry we get a hard edge. When we paint wet onto wet we get a softer edge. When we paint wet next to wet we get a softer edge. At the moment we're painting wet onto wet so we're getting them spreading out a bit. And that's what we want. We don't want things too sharp and too hard edge back there. We want this soft dark shadowed light. This feeling there's a lot going on. Gradually building up these darks as I go on. So you can see I'm getting darker and darker as I progress through this painting. Building up from my lights as you have to do with watercolour to my darks. Back to my indigo now and Mount Sienna. It's me a very dark. Build up layer by layer, just getting darker and darker. And I can even do a little bit of dry brush work here, just dragging the brush across to get the feeling of the light gleaming through and shining across these. Now let's go quite a lot darker again. I want to drop in a graduated wash here where it goes from dark to slightly lighter and behind 
registered. We've got between these warms and cools we can get some beautiful effects still, still gradually working it up darker and darker until we get the feeling of detail that we want we could go in and put every little filigree in but we don't want to be doing that I'm just feeling more Let's try and do a little more there. So that completes that area for the moment as I want it. Now before I come onto these sides, I actually want to come down and paint the whole of this floor. And now I'm moving onto the floor, I'm going to start going back to my more traditional palette here of the um, more sienna, the yellow. I shan't be using a lot of lemon yellow or chromes for this now. Going to the softer colours, and that yellow I'll use throughout most of the picture. So I'm going to put a thin wash of that of the whole of this and then build up after it dries with these geometric shapes. For that I'm going to use an oval knob, it's a lovely brush, because I want to get a large area of wash straight into it, so plenty of water here, touch my raw sienna, raw sienna nicer than yellow ochre because it's more transparent, I want it fairly thin, so a nice thin wash of that all the way across here moment right down through from there all the way not much if it comes over the so let it just drag off down here so we've got some white showing at the edge not worried if it comes across the, the chair at all because I'm going to want some of it in there later anyway won't do any harm the dry brushwork with the light shining around there, no harm, and it comes through up to here, down here as well, we'll get that in while I'm at it, I wash all the way through here, nice and thinly across here first, and while we're at it, that yellow is going to be coming into here as well, we'll, whatever it's going to be, we'll do it. Maybe it comes all behind here, the whole thing can have a wash of it. Already we're getting the atmosphere of the place. You see, I deliberately haven't gone right to the edges. I've left, as you said, I shall say a vignette around them. Where I want a little bit stronger in colour, I can drop that in while it's still wet now. through here and so on. Some of these areas are thinner than others. And if I'm worse they are a thinner coat of the wash so they'll be lighter. We paint it lighter by using it thinner. We use the white of the paper with watercolour, not white paint. I'm going to stand up now and work standing up because I need to do these lovely big strokes into here to try and get these colours right, wet into wet now. I've taken my raw sienna and I want burnt sienna in there. We're going to start making, start making it a lot warmer in places. Down here for instance, this archway. I'm letting that wet into wet do the work. It's going to spread a bit. It's going to be controlled accident down here. Some more of the raw sienna in. Make it a bit more gold in places. Dry brushwork happening too. So this is raw sienna and burnt sienna at the moment. Just working up my, my warms and cools. And I do want lovely 
soft wet into wet effects for the stone. We're covering paper fairly quickly here now as you can see. Now I'm going to take my ultramarine back in with that. Start to drop that in. Nice big mop for this half inch oval mop, pro art mop. Gradually building up these layers of warms and cools, subtle changes between the blues, the brown. Try and keep the whole painting flowing at once so that any one part isn't finished before another. And letting gravity mix the paint. Wonderful effects we can get this way. Across things that just go with them, go across them a bit as well. Just really work up this uh, brushwork and texturing. And that, those reflective colours come into this as well. And then again back to my ultramarine mix. Ultramarine and burnt sienna. Start bringing these cools back in there again. You can use a, an, an oval mop um, edge on as well, you see, which saves you changing back and forth between thick and thin brushes as well, which is quite handy. I'm going to go a lot darker yet, but just bit by bit. And the cones up in the arches of this. Really get these cools and warms working for us back there. In a moment I'm going to go much stronger still and start dropping in the indigo. So we really do get some lovely rich darks happening down through here. At the moment we're just building it up. Wet into wet. And again, we'll go in again, still with the ultramarine and the uh, sienna. Darker still. Really start building up into here. And let it come out with the wet into the wet and we want it a bit darker behind the organ still to bring the organ out a bit so that's what we'll do just indicating shapes up here now I said I was going to go darker yet I'm going to start using the um, indigo <coughs> Really get some darks into this bit. Really push these blacks. 
Well, you see, we're not using black. I mean, I don't use black in watercolour or in my oils or anything else. I, I'm an impressionist, so I like to work with colour. I very, very seldom use black. It's always a mixture of very deep blues or and browns and warms. But hardly ever black. Now we're really hopefully starting to get this feeling of the, the depth of this. We should paint these darks with these little tips across later as well. Same across here, we need to work up our, our very real darks. Not that I haven't started already, but let's do a bit more dry brush work over here. We'll use this lovely rough paper we've got now, try and get some more of that texture going. So it's amazing what we can do with just a, a few colours. I want to, I don't want to lose this lovely feel of um, watercolour, so I am working quite loosely and uh, letting this wet into wet spread to give myself atmosphere and gradually build it up. And we get the illusion and the atmosphere and the light of the place. Leave that as it is for the moment and come back down to the floor again. Now with the floor I've got to come back to my smaller number 8 brush. I'm only using three brushes so far. Half inch oval mop, a number 8, a number 2. And I've already given it a coat of uh, raw sienna. Now I want to go a little bit stronger with that wash because the light is flooding across here from light to dark from that side. So I'm going to go a little bit stronger with the wash of the uh, raw sienna. Just down here, that's too strong. So take it and thin it out. And then take clean water and blend it across and in. Inside there, and through here. I'll try and brush a bit. Let that dry again. That's just dry enough now to work. We'll uh, take the number eight round and start to work up the next lightest tones, which are within these angles here, and it's that mixture of uh, raw sienna and burnt sienna. Gives us a slightly warmer tint. Just try a bit of that. Like that. Not a lot warm, but just a bit. And that's on every one of those. In fact, as it's going to be darker over the other ones, I can afford to do those zigzags completely. So I'll just go straight round them like that in one go. To save myself time. It's a bit like using a round brush for a square hole. You know, I'm using the right size brush here for the uh, right size hole, hopefully. Let's see, now that's that. That's that, and that's that. Yes, we've got to just make sure that I'm doing the right marks in the right places. It's very easy to get lost on something like this. Be a bit looser as I come down here. I'm not going to paint right to the edges here. Uh, 
and all the way around here. Almost up to the background. Just indicate when we get back this far, because it will be disappearing anyway. are going to come underneath there a bit. Right, we have better let that dry a bit. This morning I'm going to go back to those tiles again and I'm going to use a flat square-ended brush, the same width as the uh, tile bands I'm painting, to paint in the dark alternate ones. So as I was saying, round brush, round object, uh, square brush, square object. I use a round brush to go like a snake along the lines and I want a flat brush to finish off. I already had my colour ready made here because most of my painting now has been done with these few colours. Remember we've got indigo, um, ultramarine, uh, raw sienna and burnt sienna and the, um, the indigo and the burnt sienna or the ultramarine and the burnt sienna will give me that dark I need for these areas. So we'll just wet the dark watercolour that I made from yesterday, already done. And we'll see if we can do some of these alternate um, darks on here. All I should have to do is just go across in one band like that, on each one. Might not quite be wide enough, this brush, but you can see why I've gone for a, a, a flat-ended brush now. Because I want to uh, straight end. And these things are in perspective as well, so I've got to use the brush at a slight angle and straight across here at an angle when it comes from there so it takes a little bit more care in painting We have to give these a second coat jet as well because uh, we want them quite dark in places. I'm going to use a bit of dry brushwork at the edge here where I don't really want to be too strong with the colour, I just want it to come off the edge more. So I'm using the brush with a little less paint on and just dragging it across the surface here. Rather than being too neat and tidy with it. And I'm going to do the same on these a little bit, just a little bit of dry brush work so that it comes off the and actually it happens the other way around a bit as well. There's a little bit of dry brush that comes across. The other the other one's a bit textural. So just drag the brush across those as well. Just getting that tickle of paint on just to indicate some of them are more dark than others. So we need a bit more paint into some of it. And back here, just indicating a bit of dry brush work just to that out. And then on top they go quite a bit bluer. So we've got a second panel to think about here where it's uh, going to be a little bit bluer. Maybe even a touch of a touch of, of um, colour in it. Maybe even a touch of uh, cobalt violet in it actually. Just have to add a little bit of that and see what happens. Just want to have the colours changing slightly. There's a little bit of cobalt violet going on in those. So we will just change our, our colours a little bit more subtly here. So ultramarine blue, a little touch of the dark that we already had on the brush, and cobalt violet. Not painting it on too heavily, just 
dragging it over the surface. I'm going to add more colour into this in a minute. You see, I'm not trying to be exact. If I was, this looseness just wouldn't work here in the foreground, especially. I need to just push the blues a little more in places. Just a little bit of wet into wet on there. Up here is reflections happening down through here as well. So I can afford to let the brush come vertically through it in places. Just trying to get these effects. and sort of marbling texturing going on on beauties of some of these to give the effect of more three dimension. We won't do that, just pick it out in some areas. Now I think I just need to warm up the edges of a few of these a little more, not much because they've already been done. I'll just take a little yellow, a little uh, raw sienna and bad sienna just a tad and more, more of it. A tad's a lovely word, isn't it? And we'll just glaze into there a little more in places. I've already put some on to, to lighten those areas up, but I think it just needs a little more. And we'll just drag it across one or two of the other spots as well on these more round ones. Do overdo it. Be careful we don't overdo things, but. Back to my larger brush, the old mop. We'll do the same with that. We'll just mix a bit of this sienna and raw sienna and bell sienna. Bring it down a bit. I just want to get a bit more dry brush work going on. This is on this. Right, now it's time to work up to the uh, the walls and down here in the seats. I want to work on the seats first. Now, working down here we've got light areas on here which I've got to leave slightly lighter. So I'm going to take some clean water on my brush and straight away just put that around those areas so that when I put paint nearby they should soften anyway. Now I'm going to make up my ultramarine as last time, and a little touch of the sienna into it. Fairly blue, burnt sienna, fairly blue at the moment, and work down to these lights right around the edges here, just leaving it glowing around the edge. And then a bit stronger right down to them. Nice and rapidly. You want to get in your way too much. Just bring that perspective in from here a bit. Just crossing to the edge there. Right round the lights here, down to there. all the way down to here. There's a red line along there in a moment but we'll deal with that in due course. These marks right off here. The eye come in, leave the eye in there. Bit. Now I've got to go darker still so I'm going to take some of the deeper blues now and start to work in these spikes that are coming in here quite strongly.
we'll move down into there. A little bit more brown to it, make it a bit warmer. We'll start to get some darker areas. And these textures are going to be indicated all the way up here. These effects down here. So the indigo and the Mount Sienna to give me these lovely darks. Flip them in. In some cases they're much warmer as they come up closer to us here, certainly. Now, there's a nice dark line along there. We have to be able to be prepared to move in between these warms and cools whenever we need. I want to be a bit warmer here. which will bring the, the thing forward to us a bit more. And then it goes bluer down here. I'll try brush work again, don't be afraid. down through there and gets quite a little bit warmer in places there all the way down through here and then much darker down here and into there Indigo and the Sienna again. And the subtle move between the warm cools of this. really find these darks just here. So a clean brush or a wet but cleaner brush. Just work into here. That. And just indicate the feeling of something going on here. as we can with these bits of few going back there and the darker bits along here as well. Which hopefully will come out more when I remove the masking fluid 
and drop to the distant future. Now we have to move across to the other side. Do the same here. We'll work through with the ultramarine first. The blues that are going on around those lights. First of all, I need to put a bit of water around those lights so that uh, we get that softer edge again. Then the ultramarine. It should be happening around the outside of them. Right up and through here to here. Oh, I'm at it. So a slightly redder colour needs to come into here a bit more to the other side. Now they're very dark. Fairly strongly painted again. We want fairly thick pigment to do these darks in at first here. We first start doing these spikes because they want to show up against the background. And the canisters. lovely way to work loose is like this, bringing the cools into the warm. I'm really piling in the paint here. No good being afraid of it. Could you get in there and get it right? Lead in, lead the eye in there. As things dry out, we can go back in and make things a little darker here and there. We need drop in colour. Very necessary. So we'll have to leave that at that for the moment while it dries a bit more before I can put any further colours into that. Right, what I feel I need to do now is just go back in with a few darks in the foreground because remember when we put one glaze over another everything becomes one tone darker. So if I go back into this now and things are now dry or drier so I can actually start to paint in some darker shapes into here 
um, which should show over the top of things a bit more. Possibly lead the eye in. Same across the other side. And we just need to get the shapes a little bit clearer there. Working up these few details just to give the feeling of a bit more detail here and there. leads the eye into this picture. And the next stage would be to start putting in some of the brighter colours and removing the masking fluid because we're at the stage now where we can actually remove that masking fluid. Before I do the masking fluid I'm just going to take a bit of scarlet and uh, put in some of the red on the edges of the fuse here. I might take it down a bit yet because it's going to be a bit too bright like it is. But just to just to start things off, some of this will be a bit lighter, and the masking fluid has to come off some of these areas too yet. So um, I don't need painting in afterwards. Okay, the paint should be dry enough now to allow me to uh, start to remove the masking fluid. I prefer to use uh, a cloth for this one with my finger. And you see how easily this comes away. All of this white should come back up and this is why we use the masking fluid is so that we got lovely sharp white clean edges and it's also very important that we don't rub any wet paint because that will smear over it so we must make sure it's dry when we do this. It takes a bit of removing. It's been on a couple of days now so it becomes harder as the time goes on to remove it. Not to leave it on too long especially as I said don't leave it near sunlight because that will melt it into the paper and we'll need to tip most of these back because they're going to be too bright at the moment. Right, now we've got rid of the uh, masking fluid, continue with the um, working, put, the putting in the crimsons, the reds here, which need working up a bit. I might need to make them a little bit cooler in places as well. And uh, I'll use the mop just gently, just a little bit of, get it clean again, just a little bit of the raw sienna, because some of these lights need taking down a bit. Now the cobalt violet that I was using a bit earlier, I just want to come in and tint that over in some of these places, just a bit in here, just to give that feeling of, of light, luminosity, and link it a bit with the violet that I'd done before. So these areas here that are now a little bit too light, you can just bring a bit of that violet back, put it round to my number eight round, and we'll look at these lights that we've already left slightly soft at the edges. What I'm going to do now is just lift away a bit more of that. Just make it a little softer at those edges around that light by using some clean water and just rubbing it gently with the brush, just rubbing away some of that light around it to give the feeling of a halo of light. This paper is very absorbent actually so it doesn't rub out very easily. And then we'll go back with a, 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 a fine brush, a smaller brush, we'll go back with a smaller brush to take a little bit of the chrome, a nice clean place for that, not much of it, just a wee touch just to go around these lights a bit and just bring them out a little bit the same the other side as well. We'll have a little bit of yellow around. And some of that yellow will be reflecting in here too. Not a lot, but just a bit. Take the number eight again. Take some of that same chrome. And we'll just tint in a little bit all around these to get the reflections of the yellows here. Just a little bit more down here. Just to get that bit of extra warmth coming up in amongst these colours. To play against the browns of the others. You see, we don't have to make one colour add, keep adding, we don't have to keep adding to one colour to make it stronger. 
we can do it by um, adding to an opposite colour. So if I want something cooler, I can make something warmer. If I want something uh, brighter, I can make something darker next to it, and so on. Well, it's time that we started on the choristers, the final section of this before we actually tidy up loose ends. And I want to look at these faces. We've got a bit of cobalt violet coming into them, and a little touch of uh, yellow as well. Um, I don't think we're going to make them very orange or anything like that. Just let the light reflect across them. Maybe a wee touch of rose coming in, but uh, I think with the rest of the colours of the surplus and cassocks we'll, we'll, we'll have enough in there. So let's just put a little bit of that in first. Small brush. And we'll just take a little touch of the cobalt violet and look at these faces first with that. And then, as I was saying, a little touch of yellow. Not much, but just a bit on the side of the faces. And you see, we've almost got enough there now. What needs is a hair on top of that later. A little bit of yellow again onto them, not too much, but a bit strong there. I'll just take some of that out a bit. Maybe a wee touch of the rose coming in. A little bit, a little bit of red coming in there. Not a lot, just a wee touch. Okay, let's make a start on these choristers. <coughs> Hopefully, keeping it to a minimum, we can paint in just a few marks here and there that will denote all the colours we require. A bit of red around a collars should do the work. Doesn't want to be too bright a red. So I'm uh, going to use the cadmium and a little bit of rose. And for the hair, don't need to do an awful lot again. We can just put a little bit of dark in. We're not going to be painting portraits, so we're not going to do it in that much detail. It's just a I don't want to go on just to say into too much detail, just uh for the uh, surpluses and go back to my cobalt violet and some of the blues and I'll just tint in some of the greys
get some off there, look. There we go. blue colour in here which is so important to me because that's what I wanted to pick up on. And this turquoise blue is one that I bought especially for and this beautiful colour that it has in it. I'm going to come back onto this with a, a richer red. I'm going to use that um, burnt sienna, in fact, into here to deaden this down a bit because it's just a little bit too bright as it is. So let's bring that brown into here, burnt sienna, to link it with the rest of the painting. I might bring a bit more red in in a moment. I feel there are just a few things to finish off this painting. I'm going to work a little more chrome yellow and a little bit of the uh, raw sienna around the lights, both into the background and just surrounding the lights. And I'm also going to add a little bit more red to the uh, edges of the arms of the choristers and a little bit of ultramarine blue to the surfaces just to bring the blues out a bit.